things now, but we understand the playbook. And what I would say on top, in, in, as a compliment to what Stu said is that you have to play the game that you're in. You can't play a game from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, politically, that you wish it was like. It's not like that anymore. You, it's not. You have to be, because if you don't, you'll get run over. And oftentimes, Democrats, you know, God bless my Democratic friends, but you leave with your heart sometimes, and, you know, and we can't do that, right? You say Republicans fall in line, Democrats have to fall in love. Those days are over, okay? Um, it's a binary choice. It is America, which is Joe Biden and what the Democrats are doing, protecting our democracy, or Trump and Trumpism. That's it. That's the choice. It's not marginal tax rates. It's not, you know, health care. It's not, look, all of those things we can argue with later. But none of that matters if we don't have a democratic republic system of freedom to maintain what we have here in America. None of that matters. You cannot bring a policy pen to a political gun gunfight. You cannot. So that's where we come in as former Republicans to be the tip of the spear, to tell everyone, it's all right, you can come with us on the front lines and fight this because our democracy is worth fighting for. Being here in this venue and what this represents here at Cooper Union, the Great Hall of History here, it's extraordinary. We need to remember what we did in this country, what we have fought through in the past, those types of forces to get here and embrace that. Embrace that messaging to remember what America stands for, warts and all, it's okay. My hero, Ida B. Wells, said to, to, to right the wrongs, you have to shine the light of truth upon them. And that's what we need to do, expose. Don't be afraid to hold them accountable and remember why we fight. There are more of us than there are of them. As long as we collectively have that anger and remember what the, keep the eye on the prize, which is protecting democracy at all costs. And Joe Biden is the man to help us do that. You have got to fight the fire with the fire. And so you need your smartest, most senior, aggressive anchor or reporter covering him so that they can meet him with the same energy that he puts out. If you have someone who is a liar, by the way, I was one of the first, if not, to say that Donald Trump is a liar. I also said, he, I opened my show one night and said, the President of the United States is racist. And everyone went, <gasps> and then now, does that shock anyone? Yeah. No, because it's the truth. So you have to cover with the truth. You have to, as Jay said, you've got to call a lie a lie. You've got to, you know, say if someone's a racist, you've got to say, um, if, if someone is liable for sexual assault, you must say all of those things and call them what they are and not try to, you know, say, oh, well, he has a problem with the truth. Or, you know, he's... The problem, though, when you, said, when you talked about cable news, the problem is, is that those clips still get sent everywhere. That they're on the, the late night shows, or they pick them up online, or what have you. So, the, you know, Traditional linear television numbers may be declining, but it's still seen as a source, and people, those clips get spread around because of the internet. It is your responsibility to give the American people, the electorate, the truth, regardless of how tough that is. And sometimes you, you've got to you know, get in people's faces. I think what we miss a little bit here is that we, we constantly talk about Donald Trump, but it's all the surrogates who come on after and spin and so you have to treat them with the same energy as well. You have to, and you, I don't think that election deniers should be given air, air time. I don't think that people <laughs> who come on your air and intentionally lie to you should be given air time. It's not a right, it's a privilege to come on. And if you come on, you should be responsible enough to tell the truth to the American people and not spin bullshit. If you say something negative about a, a, a Republican or Donald Trump, then you have to say something negative about a Democrat. It doesn't. It, it shouldn't work that way. But that's the way. It, that's the way it works. Because because as journalists, we want to say, well, it should be equal and everything should be equal. We're not in normal times. For me, I hung on a little longer, even though I was one of the uh, first never Trump Republican voices in the in the media space, and I thought that. 
the country would come to its senses and the party would never allow someone with this level of ignorance and buffoonery to be our nominee. It did not go away. Well, I was wrong, um, uh, as were many of us. So I thought that I would be able to make a difference from the inside, calling out the hypocrisy, calling out the, the uh, uh, level of, of um, craven political expediency that a lot of the Republicans were, were engaging in to rationalize Trump. But there were two inflection points for me. The first time I almost left the party was after Charlottesville. Uh, when there, you know, there's good people on both sides, and I saw Republicans rationalize that. But my good friend Michael Steele, former RNC chair, said, no, 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 don't let them run you out. They need people like us to hold them accountable. I said, all right, I'll try. So I did for the next couple of years, and there were just so many things that were so offensive, and I saw the direction the country was going in, and I saw every opportunity Republicans had to redeem themselves and repudiate Trump, they did not. The final straw for me was election night, uh, 2020. And when Donald Trump went out to the East Room of the White House and claimed election fraud and undermined one of the most fundamental cornerstones of our Constitution and Republican leadership allowed him to get away with it, at that point I said there is absolutely nothing sacred to the Republican Party anymore. Everything that I thought and believed the Republicans stood for was obviously BS, I'm out. I could no longer rationalize and stay in a party that had this level of rot. And then obviously January 6th, as the granddaughter of a police captain from Paramus, New Jersey, where I proudly grew up, the wife of a federal law enforcement officer, January 6th just reinforced the decision I made. And that's the day that I made the decision that I wanted to see the Republican Party burn to the ground so that we could start something else. which was named after, yes, Steve Bannon. But um, he said it in 2020, if, you, if between four and 7% of Republicans do not vote for Donald Trump, we'll lose. So we said, hold our beer. So we went after that four to 7%. And we believe now since Dobbs, and all this other stuff that's going on, but particularly Dobbs, that that range has expanded to between seven and 11% now. There's a larger pool of gettable, independent, right-leaning, or possibly Republic, you know, Republicans that we can target because they are exhausted with this. They recognize the guy's insane. They are no longer giving him the benefit of the doubt. And you know, the tax cuts may not be worth it anymore. So we are making sure that that's who we target because you know, other folks have their other demographics, but that's where it's going to be won. This election is going to be won in five or six states it came really close last time, closer than anyone really realizes, and we certainly don't want it to be that close again, but it most likely will. And those, it's a, it's a game of numbers. So it's important that we can energize and explain to people what is at stake here. I just want to ask actually to all of you about, is this the right way to run after Trump? 100%. Joe Biden gave the speech of his career on democracy. <laughs> And I don't think got enough attention. And that has to be the framework. And to juxtapose that where he was in the John McCain Center, giving that speech with the Ku Caucus in the GOP, throwing out their speaker and throwing our Congress into, into chaos. I think that to George's point, there needs to be more attention paid to the contrast. Not on my watch and not on your watch should we let America go backwards. This should not be in recorded history 100 years from now, that we were too immature and too self-indulgent to save this country. These people are serious. They have dismantled what this country had matured to stand for. We had not got everywhere that we wanted, but we were on our way. We cannot let them turn this clock back. And we cannot be the ones in history that fumbled the ball. Now, Ali told me the way he was able to regain the title from a younger, stronger George Foreman is he knew he couldn't dance like he used to in the boxing ring. He knew he didn't have the snap in his punch like he used to. He laid on the ropes and formed a, a boxing strategy, rope a dope. 
and he let Foreman punch himself out. And when Foreman, before he could get his second win, he says, he's tired now, and he knocked him out. Don't let them rope a dope us to where we. where we are arguing about who's the most radical and who's the most progressive and who did this and who did that. That's rope a dope. You're wasting energy on the wrong enemies. We must, we must have our legitimate debates, have our disagreements, but then come out and come in the ring and fight the people that are against all of us. Our parties have changed uh, over the passage of time, of course. Uh, the Republican Party, as we know, in fact, in our lifetimes, has changed. And if we go back decades, it changed. And if we go back centuries, it changed. Same for the Democratic Party. But one thing that has been true in American politics uh, since the 19th century is the importance of race. Race is the way that so many Americans think about what the country means, who belongs. And I think even now, the, there, there are lingering ideas that somehow black people ought not vote, or black people's voting is illegitimate. And I, I have a question in my mind. If large numbers of Americans can actually face up to the fact that the present Democratic Party is a multiracial, um, multi-ethnic party. You can see it whenever you see it. In fact, look at the prosecutors um, after Trump right now, and there are black men and women. I know he knows that. Um, but the, we have a multi-racial, multi-ethnic party. And I don't, I don't hear or see large numbers of Americans embracing that part. Of, uh, of our national life. But it came very starkly to me in 2020, and uh, in, particularly in January 21, when the people who were assaulting the Capitol were overwhelmingly white, mm -hmm. and the people who were inside were multicultural and on the Democratic Party, very multiracial. Can we embrace that in a positive way? Now go back to the 19th century in which Americans paraded themselves around as Democrats and the United States, I'm talking about a country in which embraced slavery and not, none of the enslaved millions could even begin to vote. There was so much else they couldn't do. It was not a democracy. It became a democracy within our lifetime mm -hmm. uh, in the 1960s, at least to start. So, on the one hand, I'm with Ruth being very frightened about what could happen, but the historian in me says, we've been here before. They're not smarter than us, they're not stronger than us, they don't have more energy than us, we just have to have the right strategy of unity, and we can turn this country around. Be a part of the conversation, comment below, and please subscribe to my channel for future videos on New York City, and hit the notification bell to receive more updates.